Okay, I, I have lots of stories in the report about academics, but I'm um, going to move on to the, the kind of how the third party game works. And third parties are sort of an innocuous sounding term for something that's really crucial. Um, one, uh, one fellow from a PR firm described it as putting your words in somebody else's mouth. So if people don't trust Monsanto, Monsanto needs, cultivates, and purchases many, 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 many mouths to tell its story. So when the World Health Organization's Cancer Research Organization came out and said glyphosate is a probable human carcinogen, that was in 2015, March. Um, this was a document that was dated February 2015. It's just part of it. But at that point, before the report even came out, Monsanto had a full-blown public relations plan about how to push back on this scientific panel and all the ways that they would do it. So it's many pages. We have it linked on our website and in the report. Um, but you can see here just under strategies and tactics, um, before the report came out, they were going to amplify particular studies that were good from their point of view. And here under point two, they're going to inform, inoculate, and engage industry partners. So they'll develop a toolkit with key information, talking points, um, identify any message shortcomings, get some blog posts up. Okay, so now we see here this next part where they lay out tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. It like looks really short, but that's actually a huge amount of financial power, megaphone power, uh, across a wide swath of seemingly disconnected voices speaking on behalf of Monsanto's interests. So, you know, we went through this quite closely to try to understand who all these groups are. And for the report, we actually went through this and a, a few other Monsanto documents, and we pulled out just the groups that were named specifically um, and what their budgets were. So it's a lot of, lot of money going to controlling the narrative on food. But just to go through kind of what types of groups these are. So on tier one, you have trade associations. These are huge entities set up just to protect the commercial interests of that sector. So CropLife International is devoted to defending pesticides. Uh, GMO Answers was a group that was cooked up by a public relations firm to get professors answering the public's questions about GMOs in a light that was favorable to Monsanto and the pesticides that go with the GMOs. So these are huge funded entities whose role it is to lobby. Then we get under tier two. These are your, your groups that are not so obviously connected to industry. In fact, they claimed in public to be independent, but documents show they were, in some cases, directly funded by Monsanto. Um, we had Academics Review, by a fortified sense about science, genetic literacy project, these kind of sciencey sounding groups um, that, again, claim to be independent, don't disclose fully their funding, um, and produce an amazing amount of content, sometimes multiple articles a day defending and promoting pesticides and GMOs, always together. All the groups that we were fighting against with the GMO fight were all the groups that came forward to defend glyphosate. Then tier three, we have the entire food industry. So these very large, well-funded food front groups, they do, in some cases, uh, disclose their corporate funding. Not always, usually, how much, but some of them disclose that they have corporate funding. And they have very large budgets, millions of dollars a year, devoted to um, spinning food. 
we have a we had a predecessor to this report called Spinning Food that talks more about this, but um, ultra processed food is fine. Uh, artificial sweeteners are fine. Pesticides are fine. Nothing to see here. Don't worry your pretty little head. Um, a lot of them really do message specifically to women um, and often quite um, condescendingly. I, I didn't even put any slides in about that, but some of the images are really funny if you go and look in the report. Not so funny, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, it's just a very, um, there, there's a lot of effort that goes into how do we get moms and women um, feeling like conventional food is fine, organic food is not worth the money, don't bully us with your organic food talk, that sort of thing. That was a whole stream of this um, public relations effort. But so tier three was basically, we're going to alert the food companies via this team that we have set up, which includes the trade association and two front groups for an inoculation strategy to educate them about science. And the way we're going to educate them is to say um, the levels of glyphosate are too low to matter and all of the science-based studies and people say that, but then there are these agenda-driven activist people who want you to think, including the world's preeminent scientists working on this uh, global independent science panel of cancer researchers. They are included in the agenda-driven activist framework. And so this whole document really explains that more about how they would position IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, as an outlier, as activist-based science, as not real science, and so forth. Um, and then tier four, key growers associations. Those are your farming groups, farmers, ranchers, soy growers, corn growers, uh, tens of millions of dollars worth of um marketing coming out of those groups, some of it even taxpayer funded. So there you have in four tiers, an enormous army of helpers who are out in public telling us not to worry about glyphosate because Monsanto doesn't want us to worry, just straight up with the talking points created by the company. So that, of course, has a huge effect. Um, here we see the money. Um, so again, we look just at groups that were directly named in, I think it was two or three different Monsanto documents. That was one of them. A couple of others. So $1.4 billion in budgets over five years. Now, a lot of these groups um, do other things besides defending glyphosate, but they all have pretty similar purpose or messaging. And the messaging is um, pesticides are fine, GMOs are necessary, don't worry about the processed food system, and also attacks on anyone who is criticizing uh, industrial food. So that's a lot of firepower, a lot of different voices that are all singing the same tune coming from all. Uh, over. And let's see, I have a little fish. There's my fish. Really, this is the effect of, of all of this. We're swimming in water we can't even see that is just saturated with corporate viewpoints on science, control over science, influence over how science is talked about from many, many, many people, entities, and groups that you would think, like to think and no, uh, could and should do better. Okay, but first I got to do, and I'm, I'm going to do a couple more like see funny things from the documents that just show someone asked me the other day, do, do you know that these influential groups are connected right to Monsanto? What's the evidence? In some cases, the evidence is pretty clear. So this email is pertaining to a group called the American Council on Science and Health, which has been in operation since 1978, um, I think, communicating about science, often in the media. But there's a lot of evidence, and there has been for years, that this group is just straight up funded by corporations to do product defense campaigns. And these documents came out in the Monsanto trials where you see 
And this is a long string of email that is interesting to read, but it's it's Monsanto executive talking amongst each other about whether they should work with this group, the American Council on Science and Health. Well, I know you're worried. They have plenty of warts, but you will not get a better value for your dollar. You just will not. Okay. And then this, the scientists actually shared, it was something like, you know, 50 posts, two reports, science briefs, all from this group, all defending and promoting GMOs and pesticides. Um, so just a tremendous amount of output. And he says here, they're already working to respond uh, against IARC. You also see in these emails, the guy from the American Council on Science and Health um, basically begging Monsanto for money, saying, we, we do so much for you. There's nobody else out there um, doing as much as we do. You know, we're already attacking IARC. And again, this is a you know, group of independent scientists who are trying to figure out what is causing cancer. Uh, we're already attacking them for this, that, and the other thing. You know, work with us. We want to work with you. They did end up funding them because we need all the friends that we can get. So you can see in the documents how nervous they were. And now the groups that I mentioned, as I said, those were the only ones that were directly named by name in the three or four Monsanto documents that we looked at specifically to, to name names of front groups, but it's so much bigger even than that. Um, many groups weren't named, but were just sort of referred to. Um, so it's, it's, this is, that was just a piece of the picture. But another example that helps kind of put in mind how, how big the scope um, was this intelligence report that came from Fleischmann Hillard, which was a public relations firm to Monsanto. And so this is describing a campaign that was called Freedom to Farm. And Freedom to Farm, it was a classic, what we would call an astroturf campaign. So fake grassroots. Freedom to Farm was pretending to be farmers who were mad about the government trying to regulate glyphosate and they're going to protect glyphosate and there's legions of farmers who are going to sign up for this thing. But behind that supposed farmer outrage was a pretty huge public relations campaign run by Fleischmann Hiller. And so here you see that they have a, a, a current campaign team of 39 and a half full-time people in multiple countries. And then in addition to these basically 40 full-time people, they had 56 trained operatives in the field recruiting for grassroots. So huge. They also talked in this document about fake websites that they would set up looking like farmer front groups. They were also closely, closely tracking all of the media, all of the influencers in all of these countries. So a massive campaign to keep the European Union from regulating glyphosate. And that fight is still ongoing. The European Union is considering ending uh, licensing for glyphosate. And it was a they were supposed to decide last year, but it got punted to early this year. Now it's been punted again to later this year. So this is still a very active fight happening in Europe. Here in the U.S., there's really not even any serious discussion about limiting or regulating glyphosate and many other chemicals. So we have one of the worst systems for being able to regulate even the worst known toxins. <laughs>